Today's guest is Eva Jablonka, the evolutionary biologist who wrote the famous book Evolution in Four Dimensions together with Marion Lamb. Marion Lamb unfortunately passed away last year in December and I'm now going to read out a couple of lines of the obituary that Eva Jablonka wrote for her. You can find the full um, obituary, which is beautifully uh, written, in the journal um, Environmental Epigenetics. Just type in Environmental Epigenetics, Marion Lamb obituary. Um, yeah, I hope after I, I, I read these lines, um, the podcast will start and I hope you enjoy it. I think it's a very fascinating topic, but it can be complex at times. Um, but I think Eva Jablonka does a great job of explaining even very difficult concepts in this podcast. So have fun. So I am citing now Eva Jablonka in her obituary for Marion Julia Lamb. Marion was an original and accomplished scientist and her intellectual brilliance was combined with deep political and intellectual courage, a fascination with the natural world and an almost fanatical studiousness. Coming from a nature and book-loving working-class family, she roamed as a child the coasts and estuaries of East Anglia, watching birds, investigating rock pools, turning every rotten log, developing the naturalist's ardent and focused competence. She was always grateful to her parents for the freedom they gave her, and for their one demand, that she does her best, whatever best may be. And indeed she did, from decorating her flat, to gardening, sailing, teaching and researching. Her intellect was clear and powerful, and she excelled in everything she ever put to it. As a 16-year-old lab assistant in Max Perutz's lab in Cambridge during her high school vacations, as a brilliant university student, She shared with Robin Wise the Francis Perch Bedford Prize for the best first degree in University College London as an inspiring teacher and as a groundbreaking scientist. Good. Eva Jablonka, welcome to the Painting Onions podcast. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're welcome. So this podcast is about your book. Um, together with Ma Marion Lamb, Mm -hmm. um, evolution in four dimensions and I would like to start by asking what is the core thesis of your book uh, the basic uh, I, the basic uh, thesis of the book is to have a look at the uh, evolutionary history and evolutionary mechanisms by focusing on the way that information is uh, transmitted from one generation to the next and also within organisms. So we're looking at different ways of uh, information transmission, which include a uh, genetic inf uh, transmission of information through replication of DNA, uh, epigenetic uh, transmission of information, which is through multiple mechanisms that transmit from one generation to the next patterns of gene expression and uh, structures, uh, that uh, protein structures, for example, or conformations, uh, behavioral uh, transmission of socially learned information in animals, for example, social animals, for example, and in humans, uh, uh, transmission of information through the symbolic system, for example, language, which is the, what we're using now and transmitting information through now. Mm -hmm. And when you take, when you look at these ways of transmitting information from one generation to the next, which we usually call heredity, heredity mechanisms, transmission mechanisms, and you think about evolution, considering these different ways of information transmission, then you have a different way of thinking about many, uh, about uh, the way that evolution works, Uh, the role of different processes in evolution, what should we, how should we start evolutionary analysis in this case or that case, in plants or in animals or in humans. 
and, and so on. So we have a very different view. Suddenly the way that we think about evolution is expanded and enriched and things that were thought to be not possible become simple and possible. So the basic thing that we are uh, do, uh, that we were trying to do in this book was to expand the way that we think about heredity and evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, expanding. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. and ju I just want to say that uh, Marin Lamb unfortunately passed away mm, uh, seven months, seven and a half months ago, mm -hmm. and uh, so that. I hope that I'm, she's not here with me, unfortunately. So I hope I'm doing justice to our ideas when I'm describing them. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Hear that. I didn't know that. Um, okay, so one question that I have is you, you just said in the beginning that it's also about the evolution within an organism. Could you maybe clarify what you meant by that? Well, I mean that, uh, you know, when you're thinking about the way that uh, differentiation happens and about the way that, uh, uh, about, uh, about development, there are a lot of uh, selective processes during development. So cells have the same genetic material, most cells, not all cells, most cells have the same genetic material, nevertheless, your liver stem cells and your uh, skin stem cells sort of breed true. They, they replicate, mm. they reconstruct their patterns of gene activity, in spite of the fact that the, tr the stimuli that made them different during development are no longer there. So they, they sort of replicate their uh, their patterns of gene activity and their morphology and uh, and their behavior, and if you interfere and if 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 there is if there are changes, uh, if some changes in these patterns lead to cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. But we cannot. But this. But the, and there are also selection processes within during development. Only some of the cells that uh, that have certain patterns of gene activity are remain alive. A lot of cells die during development. There is a process of selective cell death. And we can understand the process of selective cell death. It's not completely stochastic. It's not completely random. It has something to do with the kind of patterns that are, apparently it has something to do with the kind of uh, uh, gene expression patterns that one cell has and a different cell may have a variant pattern. And these things are this kind of uh, this selection within an organism is very important for development. So development is not just induction of cell but, uh, of cell activities or inhibition of cell activities. It also involves selection, right? And kind of evolutionary process. If we think about the brain, then we can also see that there are there is selective stabilization of synaptic uh, connections within the brain. So that kind of, which can be sub, some synaptic connections are retained, some uh, synaptic connections are dissolved and what is retained can, what, and you can build on the patterns that already exist, further patterns, more complicated patterns, which is, which is what happens when we learn in a cumulative kind of way. So processes of selection and, and kind of evolution, cumulative kind of selection, in, particular directions are something that is important for understanding development. And of course, it is very, very important for understanding evolution. Yeah. Were you just referring, um, when you talked about the brain, about the term neural Darwinism? Neural Or Darwinism. is it something different? No, no, it's not something different. It is uh, one form of a selective stabilization in the nervous system. There can be other forms. OK. Um, yeah, and you also said that your approach with Marion Lamb um, was about expanding in a way, because when I think about school, for example, we all learned um, evolution is about genes, genetics, and mutation, random mut mutations, and um, the gene um, level is just one dimension. Um, could you maybe still go a little bit deeper into this first dimension of the genetic um, approach and maybe also, if you like, um, with an historical, short historical uh, route, um, how it 
this view has developed and when um, it became clear that there are um, other dimensions as well? Well, first of all, I think that we have, it, you, you know, it's 200 years to the birth of uh, Gregor Mendel this year. Hmm. He was born in 1822. So we should pay homage to this very great scientist. And uh, what he was doing when he was, uh, when he discovered his laws of, uh, uh, the law of, uh, his laws of inheritance of independent segregation, which is the first law, uh, what he was very, uh, he, he, what he wanted to, to see was the way that some kind of uh, characteristics are transmitted from one generation to the next. And even if, if you don't, even when at cert, uh, during certain generations, you don't see the expression of these traits, they're so-called recessive. So if you, for example, if you have a heterozygote, so that you have a, a, a determinant or a factor, as he called them, which is dominant and a factor that is recessive, or a trait that is recessive and a trait that is dominant, you don't see the recessive one, but when you're doing the right kind of cross, for example, with another heterozygote, you can see suddenly the expression of this trait in one, in one fourth of the, on the average of the offspring. So the expression of the trait and its transmission are not necessarily linked. This is one of the things that he showed. And in order to show this, and he showed also that the developmental history of the organism, whether it is a male or whether it is a female, whether is, is not important the trait will be transmitted independently of the uh, developmental history of the parent, at, at least of its sex. He made sure that he was growing the plants in very, in, in, in very constant environments. So there were not many, uh, many uh, variations in, uh, in, uh, in conditions, in environmental conditions. And this is how he discovered his laws. Of course, if he was doing it, when conditions are very, very different, he wouldn't discover the laws because the gene expression would be different. So he was very careful to do it in this way. And this is part of his genius and part of the reason that he discovered his laws. However, that said, we know there were experiments that were done later on that showed that the sex of the parent, for example, sometimes does matter. If you get the same, the very same, what we call now gene or, factor, or Mendelian factor from the mother, exactly the same one, or you get it from the father, the gene expression in you will be different. So something happened during gametogenesis, during the formation of sex cells in the mother and in the father, which is different, makes a difference to the way that some genes are expressed. This is something that Mendel did not know. We also know, because of many, many experiments since Mendel, that the developmental conditions, environmental developmental conditions can change the way the genes are expressed and the expression of the genes can be inherited, transmitted to the next generation and sometimes for many generations. This is epigenetic inheritance. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about chromosomal inheritance, and about DNA inheritance, we have more or less, we see the validity of Mendel's laws. When we're looking at gene expression, at the inheritance of gene expression of phenotypic traits, it doesn't always work. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the level of the DNA and its inheritance and the inheritance of phenotypes. This is what we learned during the last 200 years. <laughs> Uh, more than 200 years, of course, but uh, well, this is what we discovered, uh, and especially we became aware of it, I would say, began to accept it nah, during the last 30 years, I would say. Mm -hmm. okay. it, took, it took a long time for people to accept it because it became a dogma that the only thing that you inherit is DNA, mm -hmm. and this is the potential, and what happens to you during development has no effect on what you transmit to your offspring. Mm -hmm. This was very, very strong dogma because this uh, was supposed to be something that Lamarck said and Lamarck was uh, <laughs> almost a dirty, 
a delta mm. a delta term. So yeah. it was, no, 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 this doesn't happen. Soft inheritance does not exist and so on and so forth. But it does, as yeah. we have looked. And uh, the epigenetic um, part, is it, how exactly is it um, transmitted also through, because it's not like DNA itself, but factors no, it, that um, influence DNA, how, how is it transmitted then to the, to the offspring? There are, many, there are several mechanisms. It's not as simple as DNA. I mean, DNA replication is not simple at all, by the mm. way. Very, very complicated. It's only simple in, in uh, the principle is very simple. Yeah. The, actual, the actual mechanisms, when you actually look at the molecular details, it is enormously complicated. Uh, with epigenetics, you have several mechanisms. But with, before I go into epigenetics, I want mm -hmm. to say something about genetics, because the yeah. genetic system is also very, much more complicated than before. Yeah. I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. If you give a, a heat shock to the fruit fly, Drosophila, during a certain uh, stage of its development, you suddenly see a combination in chromosome number four which usually does not recombine at all, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, recombination is something that changes, that can change the organization of genes on the chromosome, yes? This is a genetic change. Mm -hmm. So environmental conditions can lead to changes in the frequency and the very existence of recombination, because in this case of Prosophila, this little chromosome four, which is, uh, uh, never mind, I, I won't go into the details of what this chromosome mm -hmm. is, but this chromosome usually is like inert. It doesn't, it doesn't recombine. It doesn't exchange material with, the, with this one. One doesn't exchange material with the homologue. Suddenly it does. Mm -hmm. right? And this is just one example. So we know about that. We know that, uh, uh, that conditions can lead to changes in, for example, rec recombination frequency. We also know that some conditions can lead to changes in mutability. Mm -hmm. Under stress, for example, transposable elements in plants begin to jump. Now, these are stochastic changes, but the level of, but what the environment doing in this case is changing the level of variability. In addition to changing the level of variability, how many genetic changes you will have in condition A compared to condition B, it sometimes also induces very specific changes. For example, Epigenetic changes, some changes that, for example, high salt concentration causes and high temperature causes, some of the changes that will happen in the cell and will be inherited by descendants will be common to both because it is both a stress response, but some of them will be specific to some extent to the pathway of salt resistance or salt metabolism and other to the response to heat, to temperature. Okay, so there is a general kind of change that the environmental condition change the, uh, uh, the response of cells at the level of the rate of the uh, uh, DNA change. And there are also specific changes. Some of them are epigenetic and some of them are genetic. There are some highly specific genetic changes that are induced by environmental, uh, uh, by the environment. And James Shapiro, who was one of the people who discovered a transposition in bacteria after McClintock discovered it in plants years ago, years before they did, they did the bacterial work, but he, just, but, but he identified and characterized it in, um, in bacteria. He has a book, a whole book, telling us that what we think that, uh, that, that this idea that DNA is just a stochastic kind of, uh, that, that all, all we can think about variation in DNA is just a stochastic variation and that's all we can say about it. Mm -hmm. And everything is done by selection. This is simply a naive view, which, is igno uh, which shows basic ignorance of what has happened in the last 50 years, mm -hmm. molecular research. Yeah. and. Um... Like, how big is the percentage, let's say, or the, the influence of those kind of um, 
changes that we didn't um, thought about before when the environment comes into play and changes DNA. Is there anything, is it too early to say basically or um, yeah, and, and I think you talked about this in the book too. Um, maybe you could go into this a little bit. Well, you know, it's uh, it's a very, first of all, most of the mutations that make an evolutionary difference, a lot of the mutations that make a different, uh, an evolutionary difference occur in, uh, in uh, regulatory sequences. Mm -hmm. And they involve changes in DNA that are not just substitution. Of course, there are also substitution. You know, you change just one letter, so to speak, in the DNA. Mm. But usually you cut and paste. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you do. Yeah. And you cut and paste in all kinds of ways. So what is so this are the these are the changes that are happening all the time, and they are the changes that are driving evolution. And these changes in the in the in the in the uh, regulatory elements are sensitive to uh, environmental conditions because the enzymes that are doing the cut and paste and all the other editing uh, jobs are responding to environmental conditions. Mm. So according to Shapiro, it is, and, and you know, you, it is very naive to think this is what is driving evolution. Now, I'm not saying that this is always specific and that the environment is actually guiding everything. But first of all, our idea that it is just little small stochastic changes in the genome, that this is the whole story of mm -hmm. evolution. This is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. How big then specific environmental conditions are. We have some examples. We know that this can exist and we know, uh, we know of, some, or, of, of some cases. We have a lot more to learn about it. It's not, it's, but the, the, what we have to understand is that we have a genetic engineering kit within every cell in our body. And this genetic engineering kit is what is altering the genome in response to the developmental conditions of all kinds. Mm. And, and we have to take it in, in uh, the effects of this are very, very important if we want to understand evolution. Yeah. yeah um... And it's interesting. It's um, it really seems then to be to be um, this shift um, or shift of <laughs> worldview, basically um, not worldview, but um, view of this whole um, topic. And even if we don't know yet how much of an influence this or that makes, it's still um, people have to like write new books, basically. <laughs> um, They have to write new books, and book new books are written. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. this is not yet reflected in uh, textbooks. Okay. Except you sometimes have a little box. <laughs> you mean even textbooks in university or in schools? Even even in university, there isn't okay. enough. Yeah, even in university, people are learning like mm. uh, something that was uh, acceptable 50 years ago. Even 50 years ago, it wasn't as acceptable as people pretend. It's not mm. just that we learned so much in the last 50 years. It's also that we have ignored quite a lot mm -hmm. okay. very successfully. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, before we go, um, I'll speak a little bit more about the epigenetic dimension. Do you have anything else to add to the genetic dimension, the first dimension? Well, all I can say is I think that uh, 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 Shapiro is now uh, producing a second edition of his book, uh, Evolution of the 21st Century. And I highly recommend this book to anyone who wants to really know the details of these processes. I mean, I, I think it will be only for students of molecular biology who are mm. very interested in evolution that this book will be relevant because it's uh, quite technical at parts mm -hmm. and it contains huge amounts of information from mainly, not but not only on unicellular organisms and uh, what is happening in unicellular organisms, but also, but also in other organisms, of course. So, I think that, that this will give people a, a very solid basis on which to build a new way of understanding evolution. But the general, but the the, the general uh, message is that when we're thinking about genetic changes in the genome, the genetic changes in the genome are not tiny little small 
uh, mutations, uh, substitutions. Of course, this exists as well. Mm. <laughs> but the main driving force, force in uh, uh, evolutionary force, forces, not forces, but but the main driving, uh, but the main variations that drive evolution are this uh, variations that depend on the genetic engineering kit that we have in the cells, which is responsive to stress, which is which is responsive to in a more or less specific way to developmental conditions which are which can be affected by the environment mm -hmm. okay and which is highly evolved highly evolved mm -hmm. it's self highly evolved in system it's not just you know variation selection and the, the variation you can you can forget about variation you don't have to think about it it's just stochastic mm -hmm. it is you have to think about it very hard mm. Okay, um, okay then. So, what is or what are um, epigenetic inheritance systems, and how do they influence evolution? I mean, you all already said something, but maybe um, to start again, um, and yeah, go a little bit deeper into epigenetic. So, epigenetic inheritance systems are systems are, uh, are systems which include factors and mechanisms that enable the transmission of variations in phenotypes from one generation to the next. And we're, when we're talking today mainly about epigenetic mechanism, we're talking about molecular epigenetic mechanisms in the cell. And Marianne and I identified four different types of mechanisms. Each type can, we can say a lot about each type because there are subtypes and so on and so forth. Mm. But basically, we, we were talking about uh, four types. The, the two types that are most studied to, today, well, all of them are studied really. They, I will start with something that we call chromatin marking systems. Chromatin marking systems are, are uh, are systems that generate variations at the level of the chromosome. Mm -hmm. Not at the DNA sequence level, but at components that are superimposed on the DNA. Mm -hmm. This can be either little, uh, little chemical groups, such as methylation. Methylation is a small chemical group, it's CH3 which can attach to the cytosine in the DNA, a cytosine that is sitting next door to a guanosine. So it's CGs that can be either methylated, the C can be either methylated or not methylated. Mm -hmm. There is a system, a, an enzymatic system that can replicate patterns of methylation, just as you replicate patterns of DNA mm -hmm. Through and by enzymes, you can replicate in a semi-conservative way also patterns of DNA methylation. Now, why? So you have another inheritance system which is working in a similar way to the DNA inheritance system in the sense that it is based on complementarity. And the important thing about it is that not only is it that the uh, cytosine the patterns of, cytos of cytosine methylation or not methylation has some influence on gene expression, on whether a gene will be expressed or not expressed, mm. active or silent, and how active, or will it have a disposition to be active or silent when, if other factors will be present. Mm -hmm. Now, and this is, uh, can be influenced by in the environment. We can influence, we can change patterns of gene activity, of uh, methylation and gene activity, and then they will be transmitted by the machinery that exists in the cell, even if the whatever induced the change, the environmental factor that induced the change in the pattern of the of the CPGs of the CGs, is no longer present. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this is one type of chromatin marking. System. Another type, which is very uh, many, many uh, uh, organisms have methylation, have the system, but not all of them, not all organisms. All organisms, all eukaryotes have a, a, the DNA is wrapped around histones, mm -hmm. around a complex of uh, proteins which are called histones. 
And these systems can be modified in very different ways, in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. They have little tails. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a complex uh, structure that involves several proteins around which the DNA is wound. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and these histones have chemical tails and you can modify these chemical tails. And the way that you modify these chemical tails also affects gene expression, whether, the gene, whether this bit of DNA will be expressed or not expressed, mm -hmm. or whether it will you know, do all kinds of things. So, and this too can be reproduced during cell division. Now, I was, so this is chromatin marking system. This, there, there are other things too. I don't, I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> it's complicated anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but this is a whole family of the, of, of the mechanisms that, that reproduce and that both maintain and reproduce patterns of uh, structures on the chromosomes at the level of the chromosome, but not the DNA the proteins or RNAs or what, or little chemical groups, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Not at the level of the, of the coding, the, of the potentially coding DNA sequence. You don't change the coding properties. You only cha change whether or not it will be expressed at all. This area, this, this DNA sequence will be express expressible. So this is one system. Another system is working through RNA or small RNAs. Mm. So it depends, again, depends on, on, the, on, the, on the animal or the, or the organism that you are looking at. But there are small RNAs that are produced, that are generated from non-coding regions in the genome. Mm. And whether they, and the combination, the profiles of these RNAs are induced, can be induced by the environment and this, this profiles, this combination, this particular combination of RNA can be transmitted from one generation to the next again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how it is uh, how it is transmitted depends very much on the kind of system that you are looking at. Uh, in plants, for example, you you have one system. In in uh, some uh, little worms called nematodes, you have another system. In the nematodes, you have actually enzymes that are replicating DNA, like you are uh, uh, replicating RNA, like you are replicating DNA, yeah? So you have another replicase. In other, in other organisms, it is, more, it is, it is uh, slightly more complicated than so. Now, the third kind of mechanism that, and this is, so we can replicate patterns of profiles of expression of RNAs, which are affecting the phenotype, of course. Mm -hmm. and that can be induced by the environment. A third kind of mechanism is based on inheritance, not of, the chrom not of chromos chromatin on the chromosome, not of RNA, but of alternative conformations, structures of uh, proteins. So a given protein with this particular amino, amino acid sequence can have alternative structures. It can take a structure, let's say, a round structure and a, a long structure, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? And the structures, the alternative structures can be reproduced. Mm -hmm. So you don't change the DNA, you don't change the amino acid, you don't change gene expression at the level of transcription, but you change the way that the chromatin, that the protein is the structure, the shape of the protein, and the shape of the protein makes a difference to, to the phenotype, again, to all kinds of traits. Whether you have one shape or another shape can be very, very important to whether you can uh, do, do X or do Y, okay? Mm -hmm. So sorry, just for clarification, um, if I understood correctly, so the DNA is actually shaped differently, and then no, no, this, the DNA no, is not the, the same. DNA. Okay. The DNA is the same. The amino acids are the same. Yeah. But it's like you can take the same 
think about it as beads on string, like you have 20 different beads, 20 mm -hmm. amino acids, and you can either have, let's say, a kind of a long kind of a string, longish kind of string with very few coils, with some coils, or you can have, a, you, can, you can take the same string and make it into a little ball, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same amine, uh, sequence of amino acids. You didn't change this, but yeah. what you change is the shape. Now, the, the difference in this shape, if this, if this is an enzyme, for example, can be enormous. You can either do this job or not do this job or do this or not or that and mm. so on. So it makes a big difference. And, and, and we understand something about the mechanisms. And for example, we know that in yeast, in some yeast, it has been studied a lot. And uh, we also know that something like that is happening, unfortunately, sometimes in our brains when we get... Uh, uh, the med cow disease. Mm -hmm. This, uh, this alternate, uh, uh, some of these alternative structures, shapes of the same protein, can be pathogenic. For example, mm -hmm. in the brain, and they can, and once this one, once such a pathological structure is formed, it is sort of self-maintaining itself. Every new every new when when the, the string of amino acids is formed the existing pathological form is interacting with the new string and forcing it to become like itself in terms of shape mm -hmm. okay this is what happens in the med cow disease unfortunately mm -hmm. in yeast these things can be also inherited mm -hmm. and possibly also in in other animals and we can also have to think that you know maybe we can trans these are called prions, this mm -hmm. uh, uh, usually pathological alternative shapes. And the prions can be transmitted in yeast from one cell, mother cell to daughter cell, but they can be also transmitted between humans, for example, through food. Mm -hmm. Yes, we know that if we eat a med cow disease uh, a kind of uh, uh, beef that has the disease, that has this change proteins, they will. Uh, affect our own proteins. Mm -hmm. they, they, they will force our own proteins to become shaped in the abnormal way and they will lead in time to neurodegenerative disease. Mm -hmm. And possibly this kind of thing can happen not only in pathological cases and maybe in, in many other pathological cases. We know about several, at least mm -hmm. 11 different mm -hmm. pathologies mm -hmm. like that. So this is the third way. And the fourth way of uh, transmitting inf uh, epigenetic information is, uh, is through self-sustaining loops. Now this is best understood if you think about single cells. You can have two cells which create, uh, that divide, that are exactly the same in terms of DNA. But in one of them, at some point in history, a gene was induced, so it became active. And this gene is changing something, making some kind of change in the phenotype. But in addition to the change that it is making in the phenotype, it is also has an effect on its own transcription, positive effect. So when it is induced, it induces its own induction, mm -hmm. okay? It activates itself. And once you have this kind of system, it will go on and on and on because the offspring will inherit mm -hmm. this protein through cell division, even if the inducer, if the original inducer is no longer in present, mm -hmm. right? Once you induce it, it sort of has its own dynamics of induction, internalized yeah. dynamics of induction. So you can have two populations of cells which have exactly the same DNA and and they live in the same present environment for let's say 100 generation. But in generation 101 ago, in one, in the history of one lineage, there was this change mm -hmm. that induced the self-sustaining loop. And in another, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these two populations will be different, although they are, be, be, because of the simple transmission of this, pro of this induced gene products, 
uh, following cell division. So this is another kind of mechanism, which is, by the way, very, very common in cells. And mm -hmm. in unicellular organisms, it is important. Now, so th these mechanisms are pretty, uh, you know, if you go into the details, are pretty complicated. Mm. But everything is complicated <laughs> at the molecular level. I mean, as I said, you know, you, you look at DNA replication, it's hugely complicated. It involves so many enzymes, so many factors. And the same is true about each and every mechanism and molecular mechanism in the cell. The cell is very, very um, multifactorial there. It's, it's, it's like there is always a molecular kind of flux in the cells. Mm. They're not like little machines, yes? Mm. There is a lot of stochasticity and a lot of, there, there's constant movement in cells and the many, many, many factors and many mechanism of compensation and of the, and, and the, the, and backup systems, you name it, you have it. Mm. So this, these are complicated mechanisms, but they are not very complicated to understand at a, at the very, at, at the principal level. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand that there are several ways of transmitting gene expression patterns at the level of chromatin of the chromosome at the level of the RNA, at the level of the protein, at the level of circuits of gene activity. This is what we have to understand. And these are influenced by environmental conditions. And they can be transmitted within the cells of our body. That's why we have different cells, mm. although we have the same, many of them have the same DNA. Mm. And what, what was surprising and what was not anticipated by most people in the 20th century is that this can be, these patterns of gene activity can also be transmitted from one generation to the next, not only within the body, but between bodies. Through both through uh, uh, sexual reproduction, but also through other mechanisms, such as, for example, social learning, yes, or through food or through the uterus, through conditions in, uh, uh, inside the, uh, the mother's uh, body and so, and also, uh, and in many other ways, in many, many different ways, but also through the guns, through the sex cells. Um, this have, and once we understand this, once we understand that these mechanisms exist, and also, by the way, they interact with the genetic system, the epigenetic system and the genetic system are part of the cell and they, are, they interact with each other. So the chromatin structure, for example, how the chromosome is organized at the super uh, DNA level can affect mutability, how mutable it is, whether or not there is recombination, or there isn't recombination. So there is a connection between variations at the epigenetic level and at the genetic level. Mm -hmm. So this is another la layer of complication that we have to understand. Mm -hmm. And when we understand that this is the reality, the biological reality, and we begin to think about evolution, we see, we understand that evolution is driven, first of all, not by selection at different levels, because you can select not only DNA variation, you can select also epigenetic variation. So the range of selection, the scope of selection is increased. And in addition to the increase in the scope of selection, selection is not the only process that is shaping variation and shaping the phenotypes and their evolution, but also the, the inducing the induction of certain variations is also important in evolution. So there is soft inheritance there is inheritance of acquired variations. And this is part of evolutionary dynamics. And this changes the way that we think about the directionality of evolutionary trends. How can we understand that? The rates of evolution and many, many other, many, many other things. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, research on humans? How I don't know, major stressing events in one life can actually then um, go into the next generation. Uh, for example, with methylation, I think um, 
there were, weren't there some studies on humans too that um, had those epigenetic effects on this one um, inheritance system? Are well, there, there others are, too? You know, we are very long-lived species and extremely, extraordinarily plastic species. Mm -hmm. but yes, there are such studies. So there are studies on, for example, effects of uh, war stress. And a lot of the studies are made on males for two reasons. Uh, one reason is that males are, the contribution of males to the next generation is relatively simple. It's just the sperm. I mean, of course they can look after the offspring too, but the, but the female is much more complicated. First of all, because the egg is huge and there are lots and lots of factors in the egg in addition to chromatin and uh, and you know, and also there is the uh, the womb that is affecting it, and early maternal care, and so there are many in in the case of females, there are many uh, uh, routes of transmission of information that you have to think about. With males, there is basically the sperm. Now, the sperm, however, is also apparently very. It's much more complex. The sperm doesn't contain only DNA, mm -hmm. and epig uh, which is can be epigenetically modified in this or that way. It also contains a hell of a lot of RNA. Mm -hmm. and, this can, and this can be affected by environmental conditions and by stress and can lead to changes, uh, to heritable changes in the offspring. And this has been shown in mice, but it has also been shown in humans. Mm -hmm. There are changes in sperm as a result of stress in humans. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know enough about it. Yes, we don't know enough about it. So it's very dangerous to say, you know, here it mm. is. But we know from animal studies, for sure we know. And we're not that different from rats, not that different. We're not like rats because we are much more complicated in terms of also longevity and plasticity. Mm. But these are studies that should really alert us to the possibility. And mm. we know that there are changes in humans too. We don't know how significant, exactly how significant they are, although they're pretty good. Uh, and we don't know how long it lasts also. Usually it doesn't last very long, thankfully. Mm -hmm. As far as we know at the moment, and, this, and we know very little, okay? Mm -hmm. So it is also possible that some changes are long lasting. Fortunately, very fortunately, what we have learned from uh, animals is that although from uh, experiment in mice especially, is that although you can change, uh, you can induce epigenetic inheritance, for example, of trauma, mm -hmm. that, you, uh, uh, that you traumatize the, the father, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the offspring and the grand offspring and the great grand offspring inherit the effects of the trauma, you can reverse it mm -hmm. in one generation. And how? Simply by enriching the environment, mm -hmm. by making the environment very rich and, um, you know, Rich as an appealing in some way, or how do you mean it's rich? Rich is that they have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. They, uh, it's uh, you know, they can exercise and they can have uh, their multiple uh, ways in which they're. It's it, they have uh, different foods. They have uh, mm -hmm. uh, social partners. They have all kinds of things that normally they don't have in their in their poor existence uh, mm -hmm. in the cages. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you do that, you can reverse the, and, and the, you know, interesting foods and interesting toys and interesting exercises that they can do. And, you know, they have friends, all kinds of stuff. And this wonderfully can reverse the effects. So although we can inherit, unfortunately, if, uh, epigenetic, uh, bad epigenetic effects, it is possible to reverse them. Mm -hmm. We have to do it actively. If you just retain the same environment, it will not happen. Mm, right you again need the environment for that you have to you have to change the environment mm. in the right way mm -hmm. okay um before we go to the next dimension do you want to add any anything else um to the epigenetic dimension or there are so many things one <laughs> can talk about here mm -hmm. you know I, I was not talking about speciation and about the and about what happens how speciation can happen through an epigenetic by start, uh, starting with epigenetic effects and epigenetic adaptation, then there is no single aspect of evolutionary biology that you cannot 
sort of reinterpret and enrich by including epigenetic inheritance. In. Not mm. one. Mm. So, and we listed uh, many of these things in this little book that we wrote. Uh, I don't know if you know it. Inheritance 20, system. I think. Yeah. This one. Um, inheritance system and the extended evolutionary system. Yeah. There is a whole load of stuff there, as much as you want and more, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I will put it um, in the description of the video. Um, yeah. Okay, so the next so, one. So you have Sorry. many, many examples from, from plants and from animals and from in speciation and, you know, macroevolution and microevolution at, at the population <laughs> level, uh, population genetics, population epigenetics, whatever you like. Mm. So every aspect of evolutionary biology will be reinterpreted and enriched in many important ways if we take this on board. We don't see evolution in the same way. We really don't. Yeah. It's much more interesting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, the book you just showed, is it um, more like technical than the four um, evolution in four dimensions or is it similar but just shorter? First of all, it's short. This yeah. is a great advantage. <laughs> and uh, so it's only 75 pages. Some bits of it are more uh, technical because it's condensed. Mm -hmm. So if you just want to end the, uh, oh, very difficult. Yeah, it's uh, we try to make it as uh, reader friendly as possible. It, but I don't know; it's difficult for me to judge. Mm. Is yeah. was evolution for the mentions very difficult? Um, it was a lot that I have to say. In some parts, for me as a, a not knower of, of biology, basically, um, at some points it was um, detailed, uh, for me a little bit too detailed. But then again, I knew, okay, um, I can skip some pages and uh, yeah, um, that's I okay. Is, yeah, I think this is a good thing. I mean, you can skip. Yeah. If you, but we, we give a lot of information and a lot of references and people can look it up. Whoever yeah. is skeptical about it or wants to know more, I mean, they have the book and they can look it up. Yeah. Uh, this book also contains a little bit of the philosophical aspects of the mm -hmm. philosophical implications of uh, for the extended synthesis, because it is basically looking at the project of extending the evolutionary synthesis mm -hmm. through the lens of epigenetic of uh, of uh, epige uh, of non non genetic and of genetic and non genetic inheritance systems. So it's mm -hmm. called inheritance systems and the extended evolutionary synthesis. Yeah. It says that we have to extend the synthesis, which we really do have to do, because it's you know science yeah. is advancing and our ideas are are changing and it's it, we we just we just can't just say that you know it like, like we are not religious zealots. Mm -hmm. We're scientists, so we have to accept that and accommodate it. And uh, so this is what we're trying to do there. So because it is uh, focused on the extended evolutionary synthesis uh, and we're trying from this point of view, I mean, it is, we're also looking, and because it is also, it is within the framework of uh, short books, which uh, for also for philosophers of biology, mm -hmm. It has more about the philosophical implications for evolutionary theory than we have mm. in uh, evolution for dimensions. Mm -hmm. And some aspects of history we have here that we don't have in evolution for dimensions. For example, the sad and horrible story of what happened in Vienna in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go into that or? If you want, I can go into that. I mean, sure. uh, there was uh, this uh, great institute for uh, biological research that was um, established in Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century by three mm -hmm. uh, Jewish uh, scientists, mm -hmm. rich Jewish scientists. It was mm -hmm. the biggest, I think, institute for a private institute for biological research at the time in the world it became. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a and the uh, the project in this uh, institute was uh, to uh, study plasticity, the ability of organisms to adapt to the environment, and also to look at plastic at changes, plastic changes, flexibility, 
this kind of uh, flexibility that are inherited from one generation to the next. This was the project. Mm -hmm. And already in, in the, 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 uh, this institute was uh, established in, uh, in 1902. And already in 1912, they said, well, we have the evidence. The question is, how does it happen? What are the mechanisms? Mm -hmm. right. Lots and lots of people work there. One of them was uh, the infamous Kammerer, mm -hmm. who did this experiments on the midwife toad that uh, were thought to be fraudulent. We don't know that they were, but they were thought to be fraudulent. And uh, but, uh, uh, hundreds of people came there, hundreds of experiments, hundreds of uh, species were studied there. It was a great, uh, great institute with a lot, a lot of very interesting research. Mm -hmm. uh, but it happened during the time when the Nazis uh, uh, began to dominate mm -hmm. the political and the uh, political world. And uh, they, were the there were many Jews in this uh, institute? Not only Jews, of course, but mm -hmm. there was there were quite a lot of Jewish people there, including the directors of the institute. And uh, the Nazis uh, sort of kicked them out in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Some of them were murdered. Mm -hmm. And the whole pro and the Nazis uh, and then uh, the institute itself it was uh, uh, it was destroyed uh, by bombs. But uh, the Nazis who, uh, don't, uh, who became the directors of this institute and who, were, who got rid of the Jews and uh, the other people there, uh, they remained in, in Austria after the, after the Second World War and were very influential there. So mm -hmm. it was in their interest not to make it public what was going on there. And, there was, and it, the whole thing was totally forgotten. Mm -hmm. People were, you know, so, and there was a lot of very, very interesting work and a lot of evidence for the, for transgenerational inheritance of developmentally and environmentally induced effects. Mm. And it, and it existed and it wasn't one experiment or two experiments, mm. many, many, many interesting experiments were done there, obliterated by because of political, because of political reasons, because these mm. people didn't want anybody to remember this institute and what they did to it. Mm. It was very important to forget it. It's only now that it's coming back, when all this when all these Nazis are dead. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So and now the books are be beginning to be written about it. There is a, an important book that has been written about it uh, recently. And uh, not just um, not just historically, like. Um from memory, but also like science papers with data or where the data yes, science, is true? Yes, science yeah. papers with data, a lot, oh, mostly okay. science papers with data, yes. Mm. Okay, interesting, but also very sad, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's um, a story that people should know. Yeah, because, definitely. Uh, because it's not very well known. I mean, we all know about Lysenko mm -hmm. and what happened in the USSR, but we don't mm -hmm. know about this nasty mm -hmm. aspect yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of the of how a lot of a lot of good science was buried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Then another reason to read your book. Um, okay. So the third dimension is um, or are behavioral inheritance systems. Um, yeah. Could you just maybe give an overview about what these are and how they are important, and maybe also how they are important for humans, especially. Well, social learning, you know, we have a lot of social animals and they learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So we have what we call animal traditions. For example, you can see that there are some chimpanzees that are using stones to open coconut, uh, uh, to, 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 to open nuts, coconut, mm -hmm. uh, coconuts. And there are others uh, that, that they don't, although they, they, the nuts are there. Mm -hmm. And the, the and learning to do this is something that is socially transmitted. If somebody knows how to do it, others learn from it. And there are many, many, many studies. I mean, it's a whole industry now. A huge number of studies showing that social learning of this type and animal traditions occur in many, many, many uh, birds and mammals. They have different birds, for example, uh, singing, uh, songbirds have different dialects in different areas. It's not a, it, it's like 
language dialects, right? They have mm. different dialects. And females prefer the dialects of their own place rather than other places. So there is a kind that can be a kind of, re of slight reproductive isolation because mm. this is what is preferred here. And yeah, and also, uh, for example, songs can change. Females very often like more complicated songs. Yes. Mm -hmm. So males that uh, that sing in this in this way have uh, greater success, mating success, and they can transmit. And this song can be transmitted. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds. Of, so this, but there are all kind, many, many the ways that uh, that the animals handle food, uh, their mating preferences, uh, where they like to live, how they like to live. A lot, a lot of aspects of animal life is learned through social learning and is uh, transmitted through social learning. I just so ask one. Learn by looking and imitating or yeah. learning from others, and you transmit this to not only to your offspring but also to whoever sees you, to your neighbors, to your, uh, to, to your friends, to whoever. Mm. Just one quick question. Um, when you talk about the bird um, singing more complicated, is there then also maybe an interaction possible? Because maybe it's um, a capacity to, to sing more complicated. So then that it wouldn't be just the social learning part by learning how to sing complicated, but also having the abilities or is it really then yes, just- Yes, 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 of okay. course. I mean, you always have, you know, the, the point is that you always have uh, Indeed. Of course, there will be genetic variation too, which will influence the ability. Mm. But it's not just the ability, yeah. because there is a lot of ability over there yeah, and around us. If there's no the social learning, yeah. not, uh, is, is not expressed. The mm. point is also what is very important about these things, and this is a point that I would like to stress. It's that both in the epigenetic case and in the social learning case. The first adaptive response of an organism is not to wait for a genetic mutation to happen. The first adaptive response of the organisms is to respond physiologically and you know, in whatever way it can to a change in the environment or to learn a new thing. When a new predator is coming to your area, you're not sitting there and, say, and saying, well, I'll wait for a mutation that will save you. You do whatever you can in order to save yourself, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you do. And then others can learn from you, for example. Or if you're a plant, you can't run away and you can't behave, but you can change your physiology in all kinds of ways and it can have epigenetic effects which can be inherited. So mm -hmm. this is the first thing that you do. And then of course, any genetic mutation that supports these things, that supports this behavior will be selected. Obviously, any mm -hmm. genetic mutation that makes it easier for you to respond epigenetically in the right way and, to, and for this to be transmitted or to socially learn better mm. will, be, will be selected. So there will be, but you start not with the, usually, not always, but you don't mm. start with the genetic, you start with the phenotype, mm -hmm. with the phenotypic adaptation. And Mary Jane West Eberhard, who is a great uh, biologist, had this wonderful phrase. She said, genes are followers, not leaders in evolution. Mm -hmm. The leaders in evolution are the phenotypic changes. The if you have behavior, the behavioral changes, the physiological changes, the epigenetic changes, they lead. And then you have the stabilization and the elaboration and, and the, and, uh, of this through supporting genetic changes. And this is important. So you don't start the analysis from the, when you're, when you're looking at, epigen uh, at, at changes in the history of life, when you try to understand adaptation, when you try to understand what's going on, you don't start from the genetics. Mm -hmm. You start from what is driving it, and then you look at the genetics. Of course, you can look at whatever you like. You can look at the genetics too, and it mm -hmm. will give you quite a lot of information. It depends what your question is. But if you want to understand the process of change itself, the actual process of change, how it happens, what its dynamics are, mm -hmm. then it is a very good idea to start from heritable phenotypic changes mm -hmm. and look at all, the, at all the things that are contributing to them. There will be genetic contributions, epigenetic contributions, 
so, uh, socially learned contributions, in the case of humans, also symbolic contribution, uh, contributions mm -hmm. through the symbolic system, right? But so there will be all of them will be important, all of mm -hmm. them. But what initiates the process is will be usually at a higher level of uh, of organization and higher level and and a, a inheritance system that is at a higher level, mm -hmm. such as social learning, epigenetics, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, could you also go a little bit more into the human? Um, side of things um, because this podcast in the end it's about how humans work um, is there also a lot of research going on on this um, behavioral part um, or is it would you say well a part of psychology research or something because there we also have like model um, if I translate it like that model learning <laughs> you know if you um, because I'm becoming a psychotherapist for example and then and there we also have um, this huge uh, part of model learning, especially for children and how they learn how to to do things in, for good or bad reasons or for for better or worse. Um, yeah, just by social learning and seeing others do something and then doing it themselves. Um, is it just the psychology research or is also in your field like evolutionary science, if you call it like that, um, that are doing I mean, different a, things then, yeah. There is a whole uh, area, a, a whole discipline of uh, cultural evolution, mm -hmm. which is trying to look at, at the changes in cultures and understand them as evolutionary processes. And it's using evolution, uh, the models of evolutionary biology, evolution population and quantitative genetics kind of models in order to follow changes in uh, in populations you know if you, you 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 know take take a very simple example just you know just just a very simple example a very simplistic example let's say that you have a population that has a certain uh, food preferences right that they like to eat for example very spicy food in some mm -hmm. area and they grow the spices and they have a, a certain culinary tradition and uh, and this is also related to their uh, religious uh, uh, to, 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 to religious rights and it's connected with status maybe or many many different things mm. right so just look at this this is a complex uh, it's part of a social uh, of a of a, a cultural complex and now imagine that you, this population is not migrating somewhere else mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. uh, some people from these populations are migrating and they're coming to a population where the spicy food are not that common. What do you do? So there are all kinds of things that you can do that can happen here. The the, the, and, and also, by the way, when you're thinking about these food preferences, of course, uh, you inherit food pre preferences through the womb. Mm -hmm. Yes, the food, the mother, what, what your mother eats during pregnancy is influencing your, your food preferences too. So this also has an effect. Now, let's say that this that some people from this population migrate to a new place. So it depends on many, many factors. How big is the uh, uh, immigrant population and so on and so forth. But let's say it's not very small. It's not just three people. Let's say it's a, you know, there are enough people there that are migrating, let's say, to the United States from mm -hmm. India or from where, or, or to England from India. What do they do? They can do several things. They can adapt to the local uh, food preferences, or they can bring with them their own food preferences and try to import the spices and try to do, to, uh, to open restaurants mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, Indian restaurants and try to, to do all kinds, to, to retain this kind of things. And in many cases they do, but also it will change because it will be influenced by the local thing. So you can think about all these processes and you can do a sociological and psychological and population kind of analysis mm. to understand how this kind of changes happen. And in this case, you cannot say it is adaptive or not adaptive, you know, adaptive or not adaptive, all the foods are okay. Mm -hmm. But this is what you're used to. This is what you like. This is what you inherit. This is how 
people in this population behave. Of course, there will be also other things that you can. Uh, so in this case, it may be selectively neutral uh, from the point of view of the actual food itself. It doesn't matter which food you eat, but it does matter for you culturally. Yes, and and you can think about this whole process of uh, change in this case, uh, cultural change in culinary tradition through a sociological evolutionary kind of prism perspective. It's not very easy to do. You can you can make and you can look at it in different ways and the different the different ways of of analyzing it will give you more or less uh, deep answers to what is going on, not just to the dynamics. Maybe you can follow the dynamics without knowing too much about all the sociological factors. But if you want to know exactly how this happens, you do have to go into the sociological and psychological factors. So it depends very much on your question. But this is, for example, an example for uh, uh, for, for something that uh, you can study, uh, that, uh, that people who are interested in cultural evolution are studying. I'll give you another example, mm -hmm. which is uh, very interesting because it involves the genetic system. And this is uh, the spread of sign language. Mm -hmm. Now, the spread, uh, people in the United States, for example, started uh, using uh, sign language about 200 years ago something like that. Before that, people who were uh, who did not hear and could not speak because they could not hear uh, were regarded as many of them as retarded. And they also had a lot of social problems. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, with the introduction of sign language, what happened was the creation of school of signing schools. Now, kids learned to sign and of course they because they learned to sign they commute they had friends who also were uh, had the same kind of problem mm. and this were the people with whom they could communicate they also brought the sign language home mm. to their brothers who some many of them could hear and talk but nevertheless learned it in order to communicate with them now, what is the result of that? The result is that the uh, people who are at that time deaf uh, and mute married with others who are deaf and mute or with those that learned deaf and mute language from the deaf and mute, from the brothers and sisters, right? Now, many of the case, the, the, uh, uh, this uh, deaf and mute phenotype is due to many different mutations. There are many, many different mutations that underlie it. But there is one that is very common, which is called connexin deafness. It's a recessive mutation. Mm -hmm. Now, the, when you are looking at the genetics of this uh, mutation of the, of the phenotype, you are seeing that connexin deafness increased twofold in the United States as a result of sign language. Now this makes sense because, because, mm -hmm. because you see more homozygous now, mm. right? Yeah. So it makes absolute sense. It's not that the frequency of the gene went up a lot. It went up a little because they, because they were not considered as retarded and so on. Mm. They, there was a different, but mainly the number of homozygous people increased twofold because of a cultural change. Mm -hmm. So this shows you how a cultural change can lead to a genetic change in, in the composition of the, of the, of the population, mm. right? It's a very, very nice and neat example. And this happened very quickly, 200, generation, it took, uh, 200 years, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about it, for example, think about not sign language, think about our language, natural language. Mm -hmm. When it first evolved, it would be very similar, I think. Those who can speak, those who can understand better, would prefer those who understand them better <laughs> and who, with whom they can talk. So there will be this kind of, we call it in biology, associative mating. Mm -hmm. 
non-random mating with respect to this trait, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it will, in the, the pace of evolution will be much greater. And this is a very nice example which shows you that you have, that it is a good idea very often to think first about the phenotype and then about the genes. The mm. genes will follow. Yeah. The genes followed in this case. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I also thought or heard about, uh, heard about the um, paper by, or yeah, let, let's say paper by B.F. Skinner, um, Selection by Consequences. Um, mm. I don't know, do you know the paper? Or oh. the the idea, <laughs> um, yeah. So, or maybe could you then describe what the idea is? And because as a psychologist, I really found fascinated fascinating, um, yeah, that those evolutionary ideas can also be linked to to the behavior in yeah, basically or, or for an individual and across um, his or her lifespan then. Well, the basic idea is very simple. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a basically that selection is a general principle. It's not just selection. It's a, you, you select behaviors. And how do you select behaviors? Mm -hmm. By rewarding them or not rewarding them. So, you know, let's put a rat in a, in a, 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 hungry, a, a hungry rat in a, in a, in, in a cage, cage sure. with yeah. all kinds of things in it. And it is, it is hungry and it is, uh, but not very hungry. Yeah? because you don't want it to be debilitated by stress. Mm -hmm. And it will start exploring its environment and try all kinds of things and it will push something and food will come. And when the food will come, it will eat it and, it, 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 and it's very rewarding for it because it is slightly hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And it will learn very quickly that this is what it should do. It, it should press this, uh, this lever. This is uh, reinforcement learning. This is learning by consequence. Mm -hmm. This is a very simple example of learning by consequence. But learning by consequence is everywhere. We all the time learn what is good and what is bad, and we do a lot of trial and error. The rat didn't immediately push this lever. It tried all kinds of things. Most things didn't do anything, and some things were unpleasant, so she wouldn't do it again. And you learn not immediately. You repeat your mistakes, unfortunately, very often. <laughs> Right, we do the same mistake, but eventually we learn. And the, the rat and us. And this is learning by consequences. So the basic idea is that there is a selection principle that is working here at the level of ontogeny, at the level of, of the development of the individual, through uh, and the, and a lot of learning is happening in this in this way. And reinforcement learning is a universal type of learning that everybody, we all learn by reinforcement all the time. We learn also in other ways, but reinforcement learning is hugely, hugely important and at different levels, in different levels of complication, but it's hugely important for humans, for non-humans, for everyone, from worms to us, it's important. And the, and the point is that the, and, and something that we learn Sometimes if there is social learning as well, once you learn something, I can learn from you. I can see what you're doing and I can copy it. And then, you know, I don't have to suffer the results of failures. Mm -hmm. I learn more quickly, more rapidly. In some environment, it's good. In some environment, it's not so good. So again, it's not something that is universally good, but the principle, the ability to learn by uh, in this way is enormously adaptive. And, we, I, and, and I think, uh, me and my colleagues think that this is uh, the ability to learn in this way and to learn in increasingly open-ended ways in, is uh, eventually led to, to consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's your or your new, newest, at least popular book uh, is about consciousness, uh, but I haven't read it. Um, yeah. uh, there are two books. One is popular, one is not. <laughs> ah, okay, that's good that you um, again have two two levels, so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean this selection by consequences really like opened my eyes, and now every every time I go um, through my days and have habits and routines, and I always think about how, um, why, um, what were the consequences that I I do those things, and what do do I want to do? Um, like what kind of things do I consciously actually want to select? And so on, and also the the notion of conscious evolution. Um, I think 
coined, I think, by, by a woman, uh, Mary Parker or something. Um, have you heard about conscious evolution too? Or is it also a silly question that, of course, you have heard conscious evolution? <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't know what, you're, what exactly you're talking about, but uh, of course, a lot of uh, in, in animals that have feelings and have, uh, especially in, uh, I mean, and what they learned, they learned that this is good and this is bad, their choices will be affected by their uh, conscious experiences, past experiences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they can make more choices if, uh, if they are able to, to remember the, mm -hmm. the, the context of uh, what was good for them, what was bad for them, how they felt about things and so mm -hmm. on, depends on the level of complexity. And of course, in humans, this is enormously, it's important. Although a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of things are sort of, uh, we're not always planning in a very rational way, mm. right? So the level, the, <laughs> there is a lot of uh, consciousness is very, very involved in evolution once it appeared on the evolutionary scene. Mm. But the uh, human consciousness is also very important and shapes our Uh, our, his, uh, our our uh, evolutionary history too, but I'm to what extent I'm not so sure. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of the stuff that is happening is happening not because there is exactly uh, there is very very deliberate and rational planning. A lot of things are not that rational, mm. but but some are, and this is very important. Okay, yeah, I was referring to or thinking about. Like, for example, through knowledge from science, for example, and to know this and that are good behaviors and, and this and that are bad behaviors, then I consciously select those because I know that these will be um, good for me in the future and so on. Like, th this, this was what I, what I meant with conscious selection, basically, or conscious evolution. Yes, you do that, but there is a lot of stuff that you do that, uh, that you do even not because you deliberate in this way. Yeah. Because this is how it's done, and because this is how your friends are doing it, and this is because you're used to it, and because, uh, and so on, and because if mm. you will not do it, somebody will kick you, and uh, you yeah. know that you will not be popular or something like that. And uh, but the ability to deliberate, to think rationally, to in uh, you know when we're thinking about science, for example, is very important. Mm. Although we don't always do it. Yeah. Even in science. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to add anything else to this dimension or should we go to the last one? Which one? The last one we already talked about. Symbolic? symbolic. Yeah, okay. You're, well, you're I gave right. you the With example language. of the sign language, yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah, I didn't even uh, notice that we had two in one already. That's true. Um, so then my last, uh, the last part of these questions is how do these four dimensions interact? Um, I mean, this is probably very complicated, but like well, in a first natural... of all, as I said, genetics and epigenetics interact both directly and indirectly. Directly because the epigenetic system changes the mutability and the recombination and the recombinability of uh, the DNA, for example. But the uh, mainly indirectly by creating the by behavior for example is creating the selective environment in which you live mm -hmm. right and uh, that's the first and also so and so the the environment that you construct we are living in uh, in we construct our niche we are not passive we are not just thrown into the world mm -hmm. we make it Even though we are thrown to some extent into the world, we are not passive in this world. We can migrate, we can change the world to some extent. And uh, this will also change the selection of our genes. So this is very, very, uh, of our genes and our, epigen our epigenetic variation, everything. Mm -hmm. So the, one very important thing is to understand that animals and organisms in general, uh, All organisms are active. This is the default state of organisms. The default state of organism is not passivity, it's activity. They are active. Mm -hmm. 
They're trying to survive and reproduce in this world and they're doing what they can and adapting in whatever they, way they can, biochemical, behavioral, and if they're humans also through the symbolic system. And, of, and genetics is following, and also genetics can be in, uh, influenced by the environment, as I said, as Shapiro is showing us. And so the, the, there are many, so the interactions are both direct in the case of epigenetics and, in the, and also uh, behavioral changes can lead to epigenetic changes, which can, lead, which can, which can modify genetics also but mainly by altering the uh, selection pressures. So we are living in a world in which to some extent we create, and therefore we create the type of selection that we and our offspring will undergo. And this is something that is crucial for our understanding of evolutionary biology. When we try to think about evolution and to think about about even, even if we think about both about short-term evolution and about long-term evolution, but even if you're trying to understand history mm -hmm. and to understand why, how, and what, and how people change the environment, how people, why people live in the way they do, we have to take into account that people are not just thrown into the environment. Mm -hmm. They are, very, very important, uh, very important in changing it. I mean, we're living now in the world which unfortunately we change in horrible ways, in ways that can lead to our extinction eventually. We're changing, no, we're not doing it, uh, we're, we're not using very much our rationality when we're doing this. We're using uh, short-term interests. I mean, not we, we are the victims, but uh, we are the victims of big companies and uh, all kinds of uh, capitalist forces that are shaping uh, the fate of this planet mm. at the moment. But they are shaping the fate of this planet. They are changing the conditions of selection. Mm. They are changing. They are changing the way that uh, they, are, they are changing. Uh, they, are, they are changing the, the climate. They are changing. They, they are leading to to new interactions between species. They, you know, some people think that the pandemic, uh, the recent pandemic is, is, uh, is due to the fact that we are coming closer and closer to animals that before we did, uh, we, we were remote from them and we we're exposed to their viruses and so on and so forth. Many, many, many aspects, social injustice, the wars and things like that will be created through this, uh, 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 ecological changes and are being created by this ecological change, which have epigenetic effects and and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and multi-generational effects so we're creating the environment and we're creating the selection that is working on us and since this is evolution this can lead also to extinction you know there's a lot of extinction and yeah as oh. you said there are a lot of um sad developments and maladaptive developments for this whole species even um, but it also creates hope in a way i guess because we know we are the ones who are design um, not designing yes, we can but change it cha we, we can, can change, change it. we can change we it can for the good or the better. change yeah. it but this is a political yeah. question now mm. we're yeah. now into politics yeah i know um, i read the book of um, david sloan wilson this uh, view of life, um, he also goes a lot into the the politic um, and, and, and the impl implications of of those things. I th I, I think yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, I always end these podcasts with two questions, and the first one is: What are your three favorite hobbies? <laughs> <laughs> what are my three favorite hobbies? Hmm. Well, I like reading a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, I like good food. Spicy and I food, like or... cooking, and I like cooking uh, okay. it too. But I'm not that great a cook. But I like I like eating it mainly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I like and I like uh, and uh, I really like traveling and watching animals. Oh, 
and it also relates to your work, I guess. <laughs> yes, but uh, you know. Or do you put your research glasses off when you watch uh, animals? I don't, you know, it's, when I say I watch animals, I like bird watching and I like watching animals. I don't, I'm not a professional, mm -hmm. right? I'm, uh, I just like watching them. And I like watching people too. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's not not that different. Um, okay, and the last question is, if you would wake up tomorrow, just graduated from high school, what would you do with your life? A good question. I really don't know. You know, I didn't uh, think I would be a biologist when I started. Uh, mm -hmm. My when I woke up and uh, when I was uh, I, from high school, mm -hmm. and it just there was a series of things that happened and, uh, which made me decide to study biology. And then I fell in love with it. I didn't study biology in order to become a biologist. I studied biology because I wanted, I thought that I don't understand the world at all. And I wanted to be a writer and a philosopher. And I thought, you know, I must know something. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to study science, to know something. Mm -hmm. And I chose biology for all kinds of reasons. And uh, so, but I fell in love with biology at some stage. Mm -hmm. And now that I know about biology, if I woke up, <laughs> I don't know. Psychology is also very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and anthropology is very, very interesting. Mm. Yeah, different levels of similar things. Yeah, um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I would probably be a happy biologist and I would be a happy psychologist and I would mm. be a happy <laughs> anthropologist wherever the wind would sort of <laughs> yeah. push me. Yeah, uh, good last words. Okay, so Eva Jablonka, thank you so much for taking your time and I had, a, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope it was uh, understood. Sometimes, you know, this kind of stuff is not very understandable, but I hope it was. I definitely think so. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.